Welcome to you all on behalf of SOAS. This is a great day, a great celebration for us all. Um, and I was also very honoured by uh, the fact that I was asked to say a few words because I thought to myself, well, I'm a literature and uh, a popular culture man. W what, what, you know, what can I offer? And I said to him, well, what, what would you like? He said, well, just a few reminiscences. So I said, ah, okay. So I thought back and thought, ah, yes, I remember undergraduate student and 18, 19 year olds, and nine, that's me, 1968, being in the bar, and the bar in SOAS used to be, you go up the front steps, and immediately on your left was a little bar. And I'd be in the bar, and we'd have union meetings, the, 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 the war in Vietnam was on, <coughs> and there'd be um, uh, Fred Halliday, Gordon Gillespie, Andre Mann making wonderful speeches, uh, talking about, you know, the, the, the American power and political economy this and all that and the other. And, and I listened to all of this and I remember being in the bar um, after about a couple of months here and I had this good friend of mine, Peter Delius, he's now professor of history at Wits. And I said, Peter, I said, what is this, um, this uh, political economy thing? And he paused and he said, uh, it's code. I said, what? He said, it's code. I said, well, yeah, but what's it for? What? He said, it's code for drinking, womanizing, and singing in the bar. <laughs> so I said, well, I, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. Perhaps I'll do a bit of political economy. And as the years went on, and I wasn't doing anything to do with the economics department, um, but in the bar, I would uh, occasionally find that there'd be my old friend Peter Eyre, there would be uh, Terry, Terry Byers in the bar occasionally, uh, and we'd uh, have a few drinks together. Um, I even saw, I seem to remember Ruth McVeigh with a half a glass of lager. I don't think I ever saw Edith Penrose in the bar, but anyway, um, Michael Hodd and others. And uh, as time went on, we used to sing songs in the bar. I used to sing the odd Irish Republican song. Terry had a wonderful, a wonderful array of, of Scottish songs about the clearances, as I recollect, and working in the shipyards and things like that. Don't remember too much now. <laughs> I think that Kenneth Walker was practicing his golf swing while we were doing all of this. And I always used to say, of course, that I was doing political economy. And in fact, I, I was reminded the other day, my very first publication ever was published in a political economy journal. What happened was I was sitting, standing in the bar, standing next to, to Terry, and I was telling him about my neighbors. I said, there's a, there's a merchant seaman in the flat next door to me, and, and he uh, you know, was on a ship, and he was in Trapani in Sicily, and he met this young peasant girl, and the two of them come back, they're living in the flat next door to me. And Terry looked at me and he said, have you ever been published? <laughs> and I said, uh, no. The accent wrong. <laughs> I said, no. And he told me that he'd got a Sicilian peasant song. And he knew of a couple of anthropologists who could write a commentary on it, but he needed someone to translate it. So I said, well, give it to me. I went back to the flat. And I knocked on the door and I went in and with Pina Neal, we sat down and over about a week or two, we did a translation. We gave it to Terry and we said, here, the best we can do. He sent it off to some anthropologists in somewhere or other and blow me down. They wrote a great commentary on it and it was published. And it was in the very first issue of the Journal of Peasant Studies. <laughs> it's the most tenuous connection to publication I think you can possibly conceive of. But there I was. So I thought to myself, I, I claim with pride that moment of, of intervention. As the years have gone on, I've kind of realized that there are all sorts of codes that get used about economics and about political economy, and most of them I, I don't understand at all. But one of the ones that keeps coming back to me from time to time is the word heterodox. And I took that, I've always taken that to mean a broad church view, a, an embracing of a whole range of different approaches and methodologies. And I remember very clearly watching the linguistics department 15 years ago. 
implode as high church theoreticians in linguistics marginalized other colleagues. And I saw the damage that that high church activity did to linguistics. It was rather like watching moths around a flame. The bigger the moth, the closer you can get to that flame of theory without getting burnt up. But at the same time, casting other moths into the darkness. Well, our particular linguistics moths disappeared off to other flames and left us, in a sense, with a little bit, for a period of time, not forever, with a bit of a hollow situation. And so I've always heard this word heterodox as used about political economy in the economics department here and, and hoped and fervently believed that that meant a whole variety of different approaches to economics, to political economy. And so I celebrate heterodoxy and look forward to your reflections and the reflections of the panel on where economics at SOAS has been and where it's going. And as a distant but fond follower, I congratulate you all and I celebrate your achievements. And I'll now hand over, if I may, to Deborah Johnston. Thank you. So I'm Deborah Johnston. I'm based in the economics department here. I'm an ex-PhD student from that department I'm all, and I'm also the associate dean for research. And it's with that last hat on that I want to talk. And I want to talk about the pedagogic vibrancy of, of radical economics here at SOAS. Now before I do that, um, most of you here know me, but but for those that don't, I always start with an apology, which is I do have a stammer. Sometimes I will get stuck on words. It's late in the evening, so bear with me, please. OK, so why am I starting this? Talking about teaching, the teaching of radical economics. Well, teaching clearly has a vital role in the transmission of ideas and concepts. Um, we know that those, that, that transmission doesn't have to happen in this way. Students can buy books, and you know, with the, um, with, the, with the online world that we're in at present, that's ever easier. That said, teaching is important, and SOAS is, one of the f is actually one of the few places in the UK that offers a coherent, grounded program of teaching in radical economics. In doing that, we've asked far more of our students than other economics departments. We ask them to be well-versed in different heterodox approaches, but we also ask them to fully understand the mainstream economics that, that, that they're being critical of. So what's our, what is the material evidence of our ability to teach radical economics? Well, I couldn't go back for the last 50 years, which is when Terry Byer started at SOAS, and he'll probably tell us the data later on in the evening. But I could get data on the figures for students over the last 10 years, which is when I started as an academic here at SOAS. And if we look in 2001, we had um, 50 students doing the masters in economics in the economics department. Um, in 10 years, that that figure has doubled. Um, and what this means that is, is that we are now one of the largest institutions providing teaching in development economics in the country. We should also highlight the role of political economy teaching in the development studies department. And they've done the same thing. Over a period of 10 years, they've doubled the number of master's students. And they currently have just, uh, just under 300 master's st students, many of whom take the excellent courses in political economy. So several of these students go on to do PhDs, and they're joined by students from other places. So as a consequence, our PhD student numbers are very strong. We have a cohort of about 50 PhD 
students in the economics department and about 60 in the department of development <coughs> studies. So what do we see? We see that students have voted with their feet. They voted with our feet, finding our approaches useful, whether they plan a career as a professional economist or as an academic. Now, if we consider the number of new practitioners a good indicator of the health of a discipline, then there's clear, there's clear evidence that, that radical economics is healthy and thriving. Um, so the pedagogic role, this teaching role is important, but I want you to think of its importance in a second way. And the second way is that it's, it has contributed to the financial viability of both departments of economics and of development studies. Um, the, our student income, particularly the demand for people wanting to come to do master's courses with us, has been vitally important. And it's helped insulate us from, the, from having to look for external funding, both from research councils and from other um, funding donors. Now, this has had an important benefit. What it's meant is that SOAS economists have been able to keep their, their independence. They've been able to work with people that they choose to and on the terms that they choose. Um, without this, I'd feel that, they, that there would likely have been a watering down of the strength of radical economics in, to keep in line <coughs> with the demand of various funding bodies. So I'm going to end by talking about the future. Everyone in this room is aware that the future for higher education in the UK isn't clear. We've yet to see how the new government, um, pro the new government proposals will play out. So we don't know how many students will come to SOAS as undergraduates in the medium term. We aren't clear what the, what the knock-on effects will be on master's level and PhD level teaching. One, one thing that I am clear about, though, is that our uniqueness as a place of radical learning can only help us. Um, in a world in which markets have failed, and the cost of this failure is a... Is a, a, a massive shock to the education system, radical economics at SOAS is likely to have greater appeal than ever before. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Uh, that's uh, if you know, for that important contribution, yes, we do rely hugely on our students uh, and on the teaching that we uh, 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 that we do here in the, in the department. Can I now uh, introduce uh, one of the uh, uh, leading figures over many many years of uh, the economics department? Uh, um, one of my predecessors. Uh, someone who was there right at the very beginning, uh, Professor Terry Byers. Dear, dear, 50 years. I put in mind of Jimmy Durante, the American comedian, who at his 80th birthday celebration is reported to have said, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I'd have looked after myself. <laughs> uh, anyway, here I am. Um, when this event was originally conceived by John, John Weeks, it was, as I recall, this is three or four or five months ago, it was a book launch of books by radic radical economists in the Department of Economics. Hence the economistic uh, bent of the proceedings. 
These books are being published at roughly the same time, as I understand. Maybe he'll tell us what they were when he comes to speak. By the way, despite what the publicity for this event says, there is no Department of Political Economy in the school yet. Maybe there will be one day, but there's a Department of Economics and a Department of Development Studies. Well, John, realizing that economics had been introduced in Suez 50 years ago, that I had been a, a part of that, a minor part of that, and had far later been head of the Department of Econo Economics, asked me to come and say something about the history of the department. I agreed. But then the event kind of metamorphosed into something broader. And when I got the program, I saw a celebration of 50 years of political economy at SOAS. Uh, that celebration, as the blurb says, uh, is of an era of radical economics at SOAS. So it's economics that we are celebrating. And I'm also building out to say something about the political economy of agrarian change. Before doing that, let me make some clarificatory observations or contextualizing observations uh, which include a little of the rel relevant history. From the blurb and from the identity of those sitting on the panel, political economy is obviously seen here as a radical economics. There is, of course, a branch of neoclassical economics that sees itself as political economy. That's not our concern here, as I'm sure you will understand. Now, the blurb is, I think, accurate when it says that the Department of Economics has contained, uh, quote, an internationally renowned group of radical economists, that's for sure, and that their presence has brought an era that has been productive and intellectually exciting. The names on the programme are testament to that, the people sitting on the platform. But I think these names don't uh, exhaust uh, the reality. There are others from the distant past that we need to remember and mention, such as Bill Warren and Biplab Dasgupta. More recently, people, Lawrence Harris joined the department in 1990. When he did that, he was a serious political economist at that time. John Sender, now retired, uh, has done and is still doing important work. He needs to be mentioned. And currently, one must mention other members of the department who are part of the political economy tradition. Mushtaq Khan, Masood Karshenas, Graham Dyer, and Hassan Hakimian. I see Hassan sitting there. So we need to widen the scope of uh, what we're talking about. Then another point I would like to make is that Political economy in its radical and often Marxist manifestations cannot be confined to economics. I want to make to stress that point. That is true as a general proposition, and it's certainly true in the context of SOAS. And I would want to certainly stress that the Department of Development Studies contains a large and distinguished group of political economists. And I wasn't going to mention the names, but let me just men mention Jens Lerke, Alfredo Sadfilo, Chris Kramer, Carlos Oya, Peter Molinga, Subir Sinha, Naila Kabir, uh, Gilbert Ashka. Uh, and two of those, Carlos Oya and Alfredo Sadfilo, are economists and could as well be in the Department of Economics as in the Department of Development Studies. So political economy is, uh, has a wide writ that I would like to, to stress. I would next point out that the notion of, uh, one name I forgot to mention in that lot was Henry Bernstein. Now, wh why did I forget that, I wonder? <laughs> My close friend Henry, anyway, I've mentioned him now. I would next point out that the notion of 50 years of political economy at SOAS conceals, in fact, a very, the very precarious nature of radical economics for at least 25 of those 50 years. So it's not an unbroken, wonderful vista of radical economics uh, developing smoothly <coughs> and so on. It was very precarious for at least half of that time. A little bit of history. The social sciences emerged formally, in fact, in 1961, when the governing body of the school instituted a Department of Economic and, and Political Studies, as it then was with, with effect 1962, when I joined as a young research fellow. And they also uh, renamed the Department of Cultural Anthropology as the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. That was their attempt to bring in the social sciences. Now, the Department of Economic and Political Studies, that's the department that I joined. Now, um, 
One might ask why a Department of Economic and Political Studies was contemplated rather than two separate departments, one of economics and one of politics. Indeed, the joint department would remain until 1990. One might think that there was some vision of a special synergy between the two subjects, a scope for an interdisciplinar interdisciplinarity that would yield a distinctive kind of political economy appropriate to the study of uh, poor countries. Forget it. That's absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the founding of the department. The answer is altogether more, more mundane. It's rooted in the, uh, not in the possible chemistry that exists between social science disciplines, but in the structure of power in SOAS at the time. Can The, stru the structure of that power that determined the department. What it was was that the then director, C.H. Phillips, calculated that he, he could get away with one department and one new head of department, but not with two departments and two new heads of departments because of the majority power in the heads of departments committee at that time. Heads of departments committee actually was the most important committee in the school at that time. Believe it or believe it not. That's a long time ago, that stuff. So he then decided, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll smuggle this in by creating this department, which is called the Department of Economic and Political Studies. And he managed to do that by persuading three historians at the school to take up political studies, and they constituted the, the beginning of uh, the politics in the school. Now, in the event, little or no interdisciplinarity emerged. The two sections went their sweet separate ways. They had very little to do with one another. Eventually, largely at my urging, I had become, I don't know quite why it happened, but they made me head of the economic section in 1988. And one of the first things I did was to, to say, look, this is ridiculous. This department has been around for too long. It's got to be separated. It was separated, and the Department of Economics actually was founded separately in 1990. And it's from then that one can date the expansion of uh, radical economics and more generally of political economy in SOAS. So yes, the roots go back to 1962. As I said, I was appointed in that year to a research fellowship. But for many years, it was a tiny and often endangered plant whose growth came far later. Bill Warren was appointed uh, in 1963 and Biplab Das Gupta in 66. So there were three economists who were political economists in the Department of Economic and Political Studies in the 1960s. <coughs> Biplab was sacked in 1972, uh, and thereby hangs a tale which I will not pursue. The reasons for his sacking was his Marxism and his activities in the Communist Party of India and so on. So the powers that be in the school weren't very happy about the existence of political economy <coughs> at the school at that time. Bill died unhappily in January of uh, 1978. So there it was, I, uh, I was left at that time. I was the only one left. And had you told me in 1988 that the possibility existed of establishing a strong tradition and a large presence of radical economics and so on, I would have laughed uproariously. But history's got a very strange way of operating. Here we are sitting here celebrating just that. How on earth did it happen? I'm not going to go into that, but it's an interesting question. Then a development studies program was instituted in 91 and the Department of Development Studies in 96. Okay, enough of history. Let me now turn quickly to agrarian change. Right. To the extent that economics at SOAS had a reputation in political economy at the end of the 1980s, it was in two areas. First, it was via Bill Warren's controversial writing on imperialism. His book, Imperialism, Pioneer of Capitalism, was published posthumously in 1980. And secondly, I think one can say, in the political economy of agrarian change. As to the former, I would simply note that Bill and I taught a course, an MSc course on imperialism from 1970 until his death we maintained a close friendship throughout, but disagreed very strongly about the impact and the implications of imperialism. That made it a very exciting course, incidentally. Uh, and out of that, Bill's preparation for the course, out of that came his book. Turning to agrarian political economy, 
Uh, this now becomes personal and I apologize for that. Uh, the Peasant Seminar, organized by myself and Charles Carwin, operated at SUAS continuously between 72 and 89. Out of it emerged the Journal of Peasant Studies, which started in, in 73, which Charles and I edited. And through these, the nature and challenges of agrarian political economy were explored, and uh, in them it acquired a particular trajectory. A powerful and exciting agenda had been inherited from the 1960s, and we pursued that with some passion, both in the seminar uh, and in the journal. So the political economy expansion in economics began in 1990, the agrarian, and I'm going to concentrate on the agrarian political economy part of it. Uh, with the establishment of the separate departments, so agrarian political economy began to grow. It was prominent uh, therein. Graham Dyer, who is sitting there, was appointed just before that in 1989 in his excellent book, Class, Stat, State and Agricultural Productivity in Egypt. It's a classic study in agrarian political economy. It was published in 1997. He's still in the department. In 1991, both John Sender and Masoud Karshenas joined the department. John Sender's uh, book, written jointly with Sheila Smith, Poverty, Class and Gender in Rural Africa, a Tanzanian case study had been published in 1990, and he went on to do further important work on rural poverty in Africa, among other things. John has now retired from the department, but continues to be very active in research, along with the political economists in the school, Deborah Johnson, who's sitting on the platform, and in the Department of Development Studies, Carlos Oya and Chris Kramer. Masood, still a member of the Department of Economics, is an econometrician as well as a serious political economist. His book, Industrialization and Agricultural Surplus, a Comparative Study of Economic Development in Asia, which was published in 95, is an accomplished study of what he sees as a misplaced emphasis on the role of agricultural surplus in financing industrialization. Deborah, who is sitting on the platform, jo uh, joined the Department of Economics later. Her work on rural poverty and labor markets, land reform and HIV AIDS proceeds very much within an agrarian political economy framework. As the Journal of Penn Studies was in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, so now, and from 2001, when it was founded, the Journal of Agrarian Change is an important focus for work in agrarian political economy. It was first edited by myself and Henry Bernstein, and we handed over the editorship in 2008 to four new editors, three of them at SOAS. One, Deborah Johnson, is a member of the Department of Economics. Two others are in the Department of Development Studies, Jens Lerke and Carlos Oya. And the fourth, uh, Chris Kay, is at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. So the presence of SOAS in the field of agrarian political economy has been, is and has been, uh, continues to be a powerful and influential one, I think. And it is one of which SOAS, I think, can be proud. I better stop this as I've gone on for too long. Others on the panel will tell you different, about different branches of political economy in the department. Thank you. Okay, uh, th uh, thank you very much, uh, Terry, and uh, thank you in particular for those truly heartwarming words about powerful heads of department. Uh, I'll, uh, can I, can I pass, uh, 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 pass the discussion now over to a much younger generation of uh, political economists? Not that much younger. No, 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 you're not, no he's not that much. Uh, the, uh, in the form of uh, Kostas Lapavitsas, oh, who will uh, uh, talk about political economy the, the work that he has done and uh, some of the work that has been done in, uh, 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 more recently in, in the department. Um, I've been asked to talk about finance and capital. But I'll do that to a certain extent. But before I do that, I want to do something else. I want to um, put across a personal appreciation of um, Terry in this respect. Because... You see, believe it or not, of this, um, if you look at this august panel there of economists, 
With the exception of Terry, I'm the longest standing member of the Economics Department. Uh, I've been here from the beginning, as it were, from the 1990, which is when, as Terry said, really the, the, the radical tradition properly starts at SOAS and um, expands. So I've seen it from the beginning, and I've seen it take place uh, basically under Terry's leadership. And I want to say something about that, not too much because I probably embarrass him, but I firmly believe that the reason why we've succeeded and the reason why we continue to do well is because the department has always, always followed, whether it understood it or not, uh, three principles that uh, I understood him to, 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 uh, to insist upon from the beginning. SOAS will do well, the Department of Political Economics will do well if it does three things. If it focuses on development economics, if it focuses on area specialization, and if it also focuses on political economy, and if it mixes the three. If it succeeds in mixing the three, then it will do well, um, and it will distinguish itself uh, in Britain and, and elsewhere. I think we've always done that. When others uh, in other parts of the country, in other universities have not done that, uh, there were moments when people wanted to transform the Department of Economics into uh, heterodox political economy alone or some such. None of that would have worked. The reason why it has worked at SOAS is because we followed, these, we followed this path. We've always mixed these three elements, and we will continue to do so, I hope, and that comes straight from Terry. The reason why we've succeeded is basically Terry and his vision. Uh, the only person I've seen in the Department of Economics in the 21 years I've been uh, in it that really had a vision for the future, really understood uh, how we could um, make uh, a success of this. <laughs> but I also have a personal um, appreciation too, because you see, I owe my job to Terry. So, <laughs> so in some ways, I would say that, but more than my job, I've got, I've got an even bigger debt of, uh, of gratitude to Terry, because you see, uh, I learned to drink malt whiskey with Terry. Uh, now, I challenge anyone to sit down to a, to a glass of malt or, or, or a bottle of malt with, with, with Terry and not to fall in love with uh, mother's milk, as he used to call it. Um, so that is something that has stayed with me too, although I would... Um, I'm ashamed to admit that my tastes have changed from Lagavulin to Lafroig, Terry, uh, <laughs> over the years. But I'm sure you'll sympathize with that. Anyway, I want to say a couple of things now about finance and political, uh, finance and, and capital at SOAS. Now, Terry has spoken about um, agrarian political economy and the tradition that uh, came from the past and he's been very successful and uh, evolved. Uh, uh, during the last couple of decades. Now, my own, uh, my own field of work has been, was on, has been on finance over all these years, um, and I'm glad to report that in the last two decades that I've been here, um, finance has become a strong point of source. That's not just down to me, of course. It's because of a number of other people who um, have taken up positions and have added their own... Uh, uh, views and their own work and so on, broadly uh, in political economy or in heterodox and uh, radical e economics um, uh, as far as finance is concerned. Now, my own more specific aim has always been to develop a take on finance that would, that would be explicitly Marxist and that would also treat finance as a field uh, in itself. It's a very rare thing in Anglo-Saxon political economy, which tends to treat finance as froth sitting on top of the real sector, as it were. Uh, it's an underdeveloped area in uh, Anglo-Saxon political economy. Here at SOAS, I've always set the task for myself uh, to, to work to contribute towards developing finance, political economy finance as a field in itself, as a field that merits study uh, in itself. And I think to a certain extent, together with the work of many others, we have succeeded in establishing a particular SOAS uh, outlook. This has also benefited from broader political economy at SOAS because we've learned from development economics in doing that and we've learned from avoiding Eurocentrism uh, in, developing, in, 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 in examining finance. Now, 
The proof of the pudding is in the eating, of course. Uh, I can talk uh, great length about what we've done, but where is the test? Well, the test has come now, actually. The test has come during the last few years. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that SOAS has succeeded in putting across views on the current crisis on finance, um, which are distinctive and which uh, carry a certain amount of weight. Um, we've done that because we've understood the crisis from the beginning of 2007-2008 as a crisis of financialization, finance-led capitalism, whichever way you're going to call it, and saw finance as an integral aspect of the, cri of the crisis. This isn't a crisis, in other words, of the real sector and finance sits uh, on, on top of it. This is a crisis that has finance in it from the, from the beginning. We were clear about that. We argued it, uh, and I think this is true. I think it's been borne out by events, and it's been borne out by how the thing uh, has unfolded during the last three or four years. We've also argued that in Europe, uh, this crisis has taken a particular twist because of money, because of the monetary aspect of things, which is, of course, part of the broader money and finance tradition at source, because of monetary union, because of the creation of this poor man's gold standard, basically, that, that keeps, keeps Europe in its grip, that has basically trapped the peripheral countries uh, in, in, in a state of um, low competitiveness, low growth, high unemployment, uh, a future that looks pretty uh, bleak uh, if it unfolds in this particular way. So we've been able to do that, and I think <coughs> this type of work certainly carries, uh, has analytical weight, certainly seems to, uh, to be able to explain a number of uh, important events and phenomena that have, have emerged the last few years. But of course, it isn't only the analytics. Again, in the tradition of SOAS, we've thought of reaction, policy, um, response to it, what suggestions made about what can be done about this. And uh, there, proposals have been um, emanating for, from SOAS and from various people at SOAS about controlling finance, confronting the growth of finance by controlling it, public finance, um, policies across the world that might reduce the pernicious influence of finance and bring some hope of uh, avoiding a major catastrophe, which is not far off if things uh, continue to unfold the way they're unfolding. Uh, the same with the EMU. We've been able to put across proposals that argue that if there is to be a solution to this disaster, disaster in Europe, then we should think seriously about default, we should think seriously about exit. We should think seriously about um, radical measures, a radical way out uh, that would allow uh, peripheral economies to find their feet and to um, restructure uh, society and economy uh, as a whole. In this, too, the source tradition comes out because the policy to respond, policy proposals to, 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 to respond to the current crisis in Europe have learned, I believe, from the development experience uh, of Asia, from the development experience uh, of, of other places that have succeeded in the last few years where finance has been controlled to a certain extent, where capital and finance have been relating to each other differently than they have done in Europe. And of course, once again, we've learned uh, by avoiding Eurocentrism and being prepared to use the lessons of developing countries in terms of their own actions. So the suggestions for audit commissions, the suggestions for auditing the public debt of Europe, and in this way, um, possibly controlling it, comes straight from the experience of developing countries in Latin America. Uh, it could only arise, I believe, from SOAS, because of what SOAS is and what he has been uh, the last uh, two decades and more. In all, this way, in all these ways, I think finance, uh, and political economy are healthy at so uh, I think things um, will get even better. Uh, we're having a good crisis, in other words. Um, things will get even better. Um, and as neoclassical economics becomes less and less relevant in terms of what it proposes for the world, I believe that uh, the influence of what we have to say uh, is likely to increase. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Costas, thank you very much for those uh, uh, very important words about, uh, I, I think, the major new uh, addition to the repertoire of the department in the form of uh, the, the research on uh, uh, financial relations, the finance of developing countries, monetary theory, and so on. Um, my, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, a, one of the leading, uh, another leading current figure in the economics department, uh, who again has been around for, for quite a while, but obviously not as long as uh, uh, Costas. Uh, although I'm surprised, but who was his PhD supervisor, Professor Ben Pine. Uh, yeah, I joined SOAS 20 years ago and uh, saw myself as a newcomer, certainly relative to Terry and also uh, Costas and John. For, for Terry and John, as first heads of economics and development studies, I think it's very easy for latecomers after me, particularly in development studies, in fact, to forget how much they owe to those who came before. But what I want to dwell on to begin with is uh, why we're here. Why, why is it we can celebrate? How did we do it? How do we manage to survive, uh, even grow and prosper, despite the overwhelming intolerance of the external world to the economics that we do? And here I want to emphasize uh, two factors over and above what Costa suggested. One is to observe that we have always been, and this is not always healthy, a very close-knit group. Terry, Lawrence Harris, and I were all members of the Central University branch of the Communist Party, alongside Robert Browning, immortalized in the Browning version, Ralph Russell, leading Urdu scholar, and a historian known as Eric Hobsbawm. John, Lawrence, and I had been at uh, Birkbeck together. Costas and Alfredo were PhD students at Birkbeck before coming to SOAS and so on. So we've been a very, very, perhaps to some extent accidentally, uh, a very, very close-knit uh, group. The second factor has been unity of purpose and collective endeavor, almost certainly most vital for continuing viability and, and uh, survival in a hostile environment, and that's something that we must sustain. Uh, one reflection of this, and this is what I've sort of addressing a little bit, has been Soaz's critical work on orthodoxy itself, exposing the limitations, dynamics, and continuing inadequacies of orthodox economics, and that's reflected, for example, in the books that we did in 2001, uh, criticizing the post-Washington consensus, and now a new one in 2011, looking at recent developments in World Bank research and offering alternatives. As has also been mentioned, there's the incredible role played by the Journal of Peasant Studies and the Journal of Agra Agrarian Change subsequently, as well as the formation of IPI, the International Initiative for the Promotion of Political Economy, and RMF, Research on Money and Finance, none of which I think everyone would accept could possibly have happened without the input that was put in by SOAS itself. But in my remaining remarks, more for amusement than anything else, I think, uh, I want to dwell upon what we are, are up against, what it is we're up against. And it does appear to be ludicrous, but you know, the ludicrous is very, very powerful. And that is the dominance of economics by the United States. And not just by the United States, but the dominance of the United States by Chicago. Let me, I'm sorry for those who've heard this before, I uh, consulted the website at the University of Chicago in 2010, and there they claim that 25 of the laureates in Nobel laureates in economics have, been, have some attachment to Chicago. That's out of a total of 64. By comparison, I had a look at literature uh, where there were three. There were 16 in chemistry, but both of these are over a period of 108 years rather than 40 years. There was, for peace, just one connection. I don't know if anyone knows who that is. <laughs> it's Barack Obama. 
Uh, we know that Eleanor Ostrom, although not an economist, was the first woman to receive a Nobel Prize in economics, or there was an economist who got a Nobel Prize for peace, I think in 1946, who was a woman. Otherwise, 60% of the economists have been of US origin, Nobel Prize winners. Only four laureates by birth or naturalization have come outside the United States or Western Europe, Arthur Lewis, Kantorovich, Amartya Sen, and doesn't really count Robert Mundell. Uh, there have obviously been no Nobel Prize was in economics from Africa. The US Chicago dominance, though, has now become, and to some extent continues to uh, prevail, uh, has now become so strong that it's outraged even orthodox economists of a previous era. Era. One of the, leading, the world's leading econometricians, Angus Deaton, suggests economics has become like evolution, where what people think is well predicted by their political ideology. It is not fanciful to imagine school boards in Texas legislating against the teaching of Keynesian economics. In Chicago, of course, they don't need the legislation. Uh, let me quote now from Bob Solo, and again, an orthodox neoclassical economist in his evidence before the US House Committee, in terms of the macroeconomic thinking and policy over the neoliberal period. And he says, an interesting question remains as to why the macroeconomics profession led itself down this particular garden path. What he answers and what he thinks should be done about it is as follows. He says, suppose someone sits down where you are sitting right now and announces to me that he is Napoleon Bonaparte. The last thing I want to do with him is to get involved in a technical discussion on cavalry tactics at the Battle of Austerlitz. If I do that, I'm getting tacitly drawn to the game that he is Napoleon Bonaparte. So this is an orthodox economist expressing views about what economics has become. And even Milton Friedman lost patience with developments in economics, so much so that he, although he was to some degree responsible for this, bemoaning that dis the discipline had become an arcane branch of mathematics. Can this change? Well, I want to start with one note of pessimism. Again, I took a, undertook a Google search for the terms similar to or identical to crisis in economics. Guess how many entries I came up? A Google search on scholar, Google Scholar search. For economics, I came up with 115. This was uh, not very long ago, a few months ago. Most of these actually referred back to a dispute of 80 years ago around Schumpeter. By contrast, the similar search for sociology, just for purposes of comparison, came up with 7,230 entries. So we really have to ask ourselves, I mean, no one's blaming the sociologists for the crisis, and yet they are permanently in a position of intellectual crisis and debate themselves. And yet the impact of the crisis on economics itself has led to no response uh, whatsoever. A sort of second uh, point, I think, to, to make about um, economics is uh, the extent, particularly in the United States, to which it's become subject to vulgar self-interest of academic economists themselves. And I think this is quite unique to the United States. This sort of began with Milton Friedman when uh, he was commissioned to write a paper to, in support of futures markets in the early 1970s, the first paper. Uh, it was commissioned by a Chicago trader. He was paid $5,000 for this. And uh, it was submitted to Charles Schultz, formerly head of the business school at Chicago. You can see what's going on here. But we le leap forward 20 years, and we find that Larry Summers, between being chief uh, economist with the US government, with Clinton and Obama, Obama between that, is making tens of millions of dollars out of uh, speaking fees and so on. As head of Harvard itself, uh, one of the reasons not so much publicized for his being sacked, he paid $25 million to US aid as a, as a no claim, sorry, no fault compensation for insider trading by uh, US. Uh, uh, by uh, 
Harvard economists uh, who were advising on the uh, Russian privatization program under Andrei Schleifer. Andrew Schleifer himself is the leading economist, this case from Harvard, arguing that privatization is the way to eliminate uh, corruption and rent-seeking. <laughs> he himself paid $2 million out of his fortune for a no-fault claim uh, compensation to USAID. Well, can this change? Can we change this horrendous situation uh, even though there doesn't seem to have been much response even in the wake of the crisis. And I want to end on one note of optimism. Hope should spring eternal, uh, especially if led by SOAS, I suppose. What I want to do is, is take you back 178 years to 1833. In that year, Britain passed legislation to abolish slavery in the empire. It passed a factory act to protect children workers. Charles Darwin was sailing in the coastal waters of Latin America two years before visiting the Galapagos Islands. You're wondering where this is going, aren't you? So. <laughs> and uh, Chicago was first recorded and founded as a village of 200 people. The end of slavery, the protection of children, the theory of evolution, and Chicago are all now taken for granted. In that year of 1833, something else emerged for the first time. A newspaper was founded in the UK. It was called the News of the World. <laughs> and as we all know, until relatively recently, it was also both taken for granted and the most popular newspaper in the country. Again, as we know, it printed its last edition, bang, just like that, a few months ago. It was deemed unfit for purpose, for reasons with which we are well familiar. But by comparison to those of economics as a discipline and as a practice from that discipline, its crimes are surely minor. And it is in exposing these crimes of economics, it's being entirely unfit for purpose that SOAS has played such a major role, even unique collective role, and long may it do so until no longer needed, hopefully as abruptly as the news of the world's demise. Thank you. Well, uh, I look forward to uh, the ground opening up and the Chicago <laughs> Business School sinking into it. Uh, OK. The, um, is, uh, our next speaker is someone, again, who's, who had a long-term association with the economics department, but uh, uh, was also uh, strongly associated with the development studies department uh, and with research, with the Center for Development uh, Policy and Research. Uh, uh, indeed, one of, the, uh, main, one of the instigators of this evening, John Weeks. Thank you. And anyone else who'd like to leave before I leave, uh, before I start, please go ahead. <laughs> I want to thank Graham for his remarks. I want to, I want to thank him for something I think I'm, I've never done. Thanks so as for its tolerance of heterodox views for the 20 years I've been here. This institution has some very serious problems, but if if you are a student and you have not studied economics anyplace else, and if you're a faculty member and you have not taught anywhere else, you have no idea how fortunate you are. <laughs> you have no idea the repression that is, goes on in your run-of-the-mill mainstream economics department. It is not only the Marxists and the radicals that are marginalized. It is the post-Keynesians that are marginalized. <laughs> so <clears throat> now in Canada, there are hardly any post-Keynesians teaching macroeconomics anymore. There are hardly any in the United States. Our economics has been radical, but it's been more than that. We taught and practiced economics. What the mainstream does is not economics. It's something like alchemy or <coughs> astrology. 
You might call it alconomics. <laughs> the reason is that it bears no relationship, not only to reality, it bears no relationship to solid logic. If you don't believe me, Ben made some quotes. Read Krugman. Read Krugman's column from a couple of weeks ago in which entitled, Does Economics Progress? And the answer he comes to is no, and the last line of the article is, I wonder if I wasted my time <coughs> devoting my life to this profession. <laughs> well, I would think for a while he did. <laughs> but now I'm proud to see, I'm glad to see he has endorsed the Occupy Wall Street movement. <coughs> what is wrong then with the mainstream? What have we carried on about all, <laughs> all this time? I used to say, when I was sort of worried about offending people in the profession, that they taught myths in, main economic, in mainstream economics. They don't teach myths. As Ben indicated from the self-servingness, they teach lies. That is not too strong a word. <coughs> Perfect competition is an analog for the world of business that we observe. That is a lie. It's not a myth. It's not something that people believe and, and they try and, and, you know, in a deluded way. It's a lie. People's expenditures reflect a question of choice as they allocate their income among various things, uh, which uh, some of which they want more than others and which they can order. That is a lie. Most people in the world struggle day to day to keep going. Their choice is not whether to buy maize or to buy, or to buy corn. Their choice is trying to buy something. Economics is not about choices, or it's about different type of choices. And they're all derivative from the biggest lie of all. If you took economics anyplace else, what you would be taught, what is economics? Economics is a study of the allocation of scarce resources among competing ends. Rubbish, it has nothing to do with that. Walk outside, there are 10% of the British labor force is unemployed. Are resources scarce? Of course they aren't scarce. They look scarce to the poor. That's the, the part of the humanity for whom resources are scarce. But economics is not the study of the allocation of resources among competing ends. It should be, it is the study of how Eliminate unemployment, eliminate poverty, generate a decent rate of balanced growth. And what the other people study is not economics. Unfortunately, it is unfortunate they have appropriated the word from us. It is as if the astrologers had gained control of astronomy, or the alchemists had gained control of chemistry are the people who ride of unicorns <coughs> were running the surgery for horses. <laughs> but the biggest lie of them all is the one in the old days when all economists, when 99.9% .9 of economists were men instead of only 90%. We used to say, or, they, or the mainstream would say, free markets, free men. Free markets lead to freedom of a wider sense. Without free markets, you cannot have freedom and democracy. No. From the 1930s, we know where the road to free markets leads. They knew it then, they knew it after World War II. Free markets, unregulated markets, deregulation of the financial sector, we know where that leads. That is the road to fascism. And that road is swept by the mainstream economists and kept clean by them. And the reason we struggle, reason we teach radical economics, reason we teach economics is 
because we're afraid that if we don't, soon there will appear a sign on the road that says, beyond this point, no return. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, John. It's my uh, uh, pleasure, my privilege to uh, be the person who has more or less the last word on this, which I can do because I'm, uh, I am the head of department after all. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, I want to say uh, just a, a couple of things uh, specifically about the department uh, uh, that are important for our distinctive role and uh, which remain important for uh, keeping it as a, a, a place where there is radical economics, where radical economics uh, makes waves and um, vitalize, makes vital uh, the, uh, even the, uh, uh, the, the, the basic uh, uh, basic, I mean, even uh, run-of-the-mill statistical research um, that we do here. First of all, uh, just to uh, remind people here, uh, the, uh, the appointment of Edith Penrose in 1961 uh, was the appointment of the first woman professor of economics in the University of London. And that's always been very important in uh, the economics department. We have a proud record of appointing and promoting uh, uh, women uh, e economists, much, much more so than, uh, than in other departments uh, of economics. So that's one thing to be, to be borne born in mind. We really do uh, care about equal opportunities. Uh, the second thing is to uh, some, something else which we can all come together on, apart from uh, the general concern for radical economics, and that is our view of our sister institution down the road, also belonging to the University of London, the London School of Economics. Uh, I do, I had tea this afternoon with uh, one of our uh, 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 graduates from this school who had gone, uh, done a very good degree uh, uh, here at SOAS, had got first class honours, went to do uh, her MSc in environmental economics at LSE. And they, there was a discussion in the lecture about climate change, and the, the impact of climate change on the economy and so on. And um, they, uh, uh, the lecturer said, well, you know, this is how you, you, you model this. You, you know, try to model it like this. But there's an insuperable, uh, there are certain very serious difficulties about all, all of this, about the climate change, the impact of climate change on the economy. What was that? Well, the insuperable difficulties are that it's uh, impossible to put this into a utility function or into a cost function. I mean, you, don't, you, you, you can't specify it in, a, in, in any particular way. So the, uh, this former student of mine was rather puzzled about this. I went to the tutor and said, well, yes, but you can still talk about environmental change and the, the impact generally on, on the economy. And, uh, as, you know, the impact on different activities and so on. And the tutor said, well, yes, you know this, I know this, but you can't say it in this place. Uh, and I think this highlights a very, very important uh, distinction between uh, the economics department here and the economics department at, uh, and other economics departments. Uh, you know, you can say these things here. Uh, and I, I, I will say also that, that here at SOAS, it leads to interminable arguments. This is a department in which the 
arguments do go on. Uh, but we do, uh, uh, you know, at least people argue here, and at least people care enough uh, to argue about the issues. Uh, I'm supposed to talk, uh, say a few words about uh, uh, the, the future of radical economics at SOAS, or the future of radical economics uh, uh, generally. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, perhaps I, I, I'm actually quite optimistic uh, about this, and that's because I, it seems to me that it really depends on three uh, factors, three factors in particular. First of all, it depends on students, uh, and our, uh, it's it, SOAS's ability to attract uh, really first-rate students uh, that I think gives me hope for uh, radical economics in the future, because these are students who are quite clearly going out, going to other universities, and like uh, the student with whom I had tea today, uh, are, are finding that uh, they, the other, the, the debates in other departments are impoverished. They are impoverished elsewhere. And we can contribute uh, uh, to those debates. Uh, the second, my second point uh, may be uh, rather uh, uh, f also fairly obvious and comes out from what was previously said by uh, Costas and Ben uh, uh, and John, and that is that the, the future of radical economics depends on our engagement with current uh, uh, political issues. It's now become a, 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 a commonplace of, of economics that, uh, in fact, the people on the right, uh, David Laidler was complaining to me about this. Uh, David Laidler, follower of Milton Friedman, uh, is, uh, was complaining that, uh, in fact, with the, all the surveys that have been done of economics teaching after the financial crisis, it turns out that no one's actually teach, changing their teaching. No one's actually teaching, changing the ideas that, that, that are being put across. No one is changing their theories. Uh, if, you, if anyone read Robert Lucas's response to a critical article in The Economist about the state of macroeconomics, uh, for that matter, anyone who went to uh, he, uh, uh, you know, you were similar in some respects in tone to the remarks of John Eatwell at the LSE on Monday. Uh, and Robert Lucas said, well, you know, no, nothing needs to change. We have the right people. We have the bright people. We have Ben Bernanke at, uh, at the Federal Reserve. We have me in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> Larry Summers in uh, uh, at uh, uh, wherever Larry Summers is, uh, <laughs> Frederick uh, Frederick Mishkin. Yes, I, I I was surprised that Ben didn't mention uh, Frederick Mishkin because for those of you that have seen Inside Job, uh, will be aware that uh, Frederick Mishkin has a, a star part in this uh, in Inside Job as the the economist who resigned from. The Federal Reserve, I think he was deputy chairman there, uh, to, why? Because he wanted to do consultancy work. What consultancy work did he want to do? Well, he wanted to do a report for the Chamber of Commerce uh, in, uh, 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 for the Icelandic Chamber of Commerce, uh, where he, he wrote a report, I think published in July 2008, uh, on the uh, stability of the Icelandic banking system, reassuring everyone that it was all okay. So he walked off with uh, close to $360,000 for this report, and weeks later, uh, the sky fell in on the Icelandic banking system. Uh, the, uh, actually, another character that appears, there is someone that, that uh, Ben, uh, John and I uh, were, you know, remember very, very well uh, because he was our head of department at, at Birkbeck College. I should, uh, I should say again, for those that don't know, I did my master's degree at Birkbeck College where 
John, uh, John Weeks, Ben Fine, uh, Lawrence Harris, uh, Sue Himmelwhite, was, Sue was there as well. Um, they, uh, and it was actually a, a very nice pluralist department. We actually were taught all sorts of points of view and there were, argument, there were arguments there too. Uh, 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 but the, the head of department was a man called Richard Portis. So uh, Richard Portis then went on to become uh, Secretary General of the Royal Economic Society, uh, wasted no opportunity to denounce heterodox economics as technically inadequate. So he, of course, put, uh, put his techniques to good use. And he too was writing uh, a report in the summer of 2008 for a very large sum of money on uh, uh, the, uh, again, on uh, the, the stability, the essential stability of the Icelandic banking system. So this, uh, unfortunately, this is what, Ben is right, this is what mainstream economics has been reduced to. Uh, it's mercenary. Uh, it takes money for, uh, for, for doing this kind of thing. It has no sense of uh, what's happening in, in, the, uh, in the economy and takes no responsibility uh, for it at all. Uh, so let me, uh, uh, I said earlier on that the future of radical economics depends on students of which we have uh, plenty of outstanding students. It depends on our engagement with uh, uh, current issues. And I'll, uh, uh, my final point is that it depends on a third uh, factor, which is uh, particularly important, and that is it depends on our engagement with economic debates and discussions outside SOAS as well. I'm actually uh, absolutely delighted that we have graduates who come from this department that go, who go to the LSE, Warwick, uh, UCL, Oxford, Cambridge, all these other mainstream places. They also go into the uh, uh, Government Economic Service. They go to the UN, they go to the IMF, they go to the World Bank. Uh, and you can always tell who they are because they're the ones who are arguing. And believe it or not, they actually like them that way. So do uh, continue uh, arguing about, uh, about these things. That is the issue. Uh, that is the future of uh, radical economics. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>